I'd like to introduce you to Krista Clotier. Krista is an art educator and owns The Working Artist. She speaks at many of our live events, including Art Expo New York, and was recently honored as an influencer in the contemporary art world by LinkedIn. Craig Cosson is the president of Chuck Jones Center for Creativity and Chuck Jones Galleries and also happens to be the grandson of Chuck Jones. We all know Chuck Jones. I mean, who didn't love the Bugs Bunny and the Roadrunner? I mean, come on. And Karen Bronze is a former actress and model turned artist, originally from Sweden and now resides in Montreal. And the three of them and myself are gonna talk about the new contemporary. And so we've picked three mediums for that. One is, which Krista's expertise is photography. One is animation, obviously Craig Cosson and Chuck Jones there. And the last of being pop prints. Karen recently created a new uh, series of prints about endangered species and uh, they've got a pop feel to them, kind of like Andy Warhol did. They're very colorful and they start at 695. So that's kind of the new contemporary, easy to collect pieces. Uh, and that's what we're gonna talk to you about tonight. So we're coming to you from uh, Montreal, Karen, France, Krista. What time is it, Krista? Late. <laughs> <laughs> It's tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> and Craig's with me in California. <laughs> um, so we're going to kind of bounce around, but the theme is animation, the pop prints, and the photography. So Craig, tell us how you got into the business of art. I was born. I was born. <laughs> so that, that was the way it all started. Now, I... Uh, I, I'm a computer engineer by training, and uh, obviously, as you said, my grandfather uh, is Chuck Jones, uh, passed away in 2002, but I grew up around him, and, and my mother started the art business 43 years ago, and so uh, I got pulled into it to automate it in the early 90s, and then it was all of a sudden, instead of being a computer engineer uh, working you know, nights and weekends and 100 hour weeks and things like that. All of a sudden now I'm in the art business around fun things working 100 hour weeks. So, you know, it was a little different, but it was uh, it was very, very fun. And so I got to spend a lot of time with Chuck and uh, I opened our first galleries uh, 30 years ago. And so uh, we've got the Chuck Jones galleries and uh, I just kind of uh, got pulled into the family business. So they always they sucked me in and then they didn't let me go. That's great. How about you, Krista? How did you get in the art business? Well, I went to art school like a lot of artists and wanted to do that career path, but had a lot of student debt, needed to get the real job. Ended up getting a job at an art studio, part-time assistant to the sales director, thought I would just do this for a year or so. And instead I became director of the company. Turns out that selling art was my secret superpower. <laughs> and ended up uh, spending um, the majority of my career in the art business, uh, selling art for other artists, collaborating with other artists. Uh, it, it was an incredible experience, a really glamorous position. But uh, when I had my midlife correction, I realized that um, I am an artist and I had stopped making. So I quit sold all of my possessions, moved to Europe by myself so that I could find that artist who lived inside of me and went back to my own art. And we're going to talk about your storytelling in a bit. Okay. Save that because it's fantastic. Hi, Karen. Karen, you're on mute. There you go. Not anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, the Rams. Look at that. that looks yep. awesome. Yeah. So tell us how, when did you start painting? I've been painting my whole life. You know, I started back in Sweden when I was a kid. And I think my, like the first activity, my main activity was painting. I just loved it. And um, I left Sweden when I was 18 and I've been traveling a lot. 
And uh, I always, I always loved to, to paint. It was like my, my go-to, you know, when, uh, especially through stressful times, it was like my way of disappearing from reality and just <laughs> zoom in on it. Um, and I've been in America since 2012. I right. came to the U.S. without knowing an American soul. And it was kind of stressful. I wanted to be an actor. And uh, I started to do it professionally six years ago. Good for you. And uh, I'm going to give you a cheers for becoming a U.S. citizen this year. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> That's amazing. So, Craig, animation is a huge collectible today. Tell me why people collect animation and then move on after the animation collection to maybe buy some of the Chuck's originals, right? Yeah, so I think the uh, Chuck used to talk about it because they, 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 why, you know, he, he even said, you know, if you didn't know the characters, especially with the, the works that include his most famous characters like Bugs Bunny and Roadrunner and Coyote and Pepe Le Pew and, and all those characters that he helped create or created over at Warner Brothers in the 30s to the 60s and 70s, um, you know, you, you wouldn't put a work of art like that on your, on your wall because it, he said it was kind of like having a picture of your, your favorite uncle on your wall. You know, it's got to be something that you connect with. And so if you didn't know the characters, it might be a beautiful painting. It may be, and because he is a traditionally trained fine artist at Chouinard Art Institute back in the, in the late 20s and uh, with people like Millard Sheets and, and many of the figurative works and many of the, the fine art that we have on the rave event this weekend uh, were created either during his post years studying with uh, Don Graham at Chouinard or uh, just him painting the idea of, you know, him honing his craft of fine art. And, uh, you know, when uh, Krista, you were talking about leaving uh, the U.S. and going to Europe and whatnot. And he said when he came out of art school at the age of, you know, he just turned 18 in 1929 and he had the dream. And he said, if any great artist had that any sort of dream about being an artist, they would you know, dream about moving to, to Paris and the Champs-Élysées and painting the beautiful women and, and dying at a ripe old age of 37, you know, that would be the, but he said that, you, you know, he figured out when he got out of art school that, that you had to, you know, make money to, to die poor. And, you know, you, cause you had to get there when, and so, you know, he stumbled into the animation business and created these and it was unplanned and you know it was a burgeoning uh, art form back then in the 30s and and then he created all these things that people then resonated with you know for six generations now into seven generations with these Looney Tunes characters and others like the Grinch and but you know it's that memory it's that feeling it's that and I guess that's about anything I mean I, I look at these lovely ladies and and their artwork and I and I think you know it stirs something inside you and that, I think, is why you collect any artwork. You know, if you're collecting artwork because you think it's going to be, you know, important someday, then you're not doing it right. You know, when you, uh, and, and I've heard artists and I've heard collectors say this, when you find that work of art that fits you, it grabs you by the throat and it strangles you until you put it in your home. And literally, it's that visceral reaction to it. So, you know, why do people collect it? It's because... It is, it, it brings a smile to your face. It, it brings joy to your heart. It brings a memory. Uh, I was at a show one time in San Francisco and a, and a couple came in and I traveled with Chuck to many shows and, and uh, they said, oh, we have seven of your works of art and we have it, you know, in, in our home. And he said, oh, where do you, where do you have them in your home? Like in the living room? And he said, and I, no, no, no. We're, we live in sort of that boxcar sort of, place here in San Francisco and get the bedroom at one end, a long hallway that goes down. And then we've got the restroom and the kitchen and the living room at the other end. So we put them all down the hallway because when you come out of the bedroom in the morning, by the time you pass all of that artwork, you have to be in a good mood by the time you get to the bathroom. And that's the way we start every single day. And it sort of was that, you know, that it, it buoys you up. It gives you that memory. It feels like you've got that favorite uncle sitting on and I guess you know, since since they are Chuck's children you know Bugs Bunny Looney Tunes all those they considered them his children they came from inside of him uh, that they are sort of my my aunts and uncles so you know it is kind of a favorite uncle that I have on my walls 
but um, you know, he's been not only collected all over the world, I think he's been collected in over 200 countries, certainly as cartoons have been seen all over the world for decades and decades. And he's had museum exhibitions uh, in Museum of Modern Art, Smithsonian traveling exhibitions for years. Uh, so um, it's that old friend, it's that feeling that you get from, from seeing this stuff. And he's a pretty successful guy, you know, in his film career and his art career throughout the time. So, um, you know, it's fun, to, it's fun to put that artwork around you. Yeah, it's kind of like, uh, you know, timeless musicians and bands like Zeppelin or the Beatles or Van Morrison or yeah know, or the Rolling Stones and yeah you know, I mean even today they still play the Grinch stole how the Grinch stole Christmas every year you know yeah we just did it I told you I you know we just had a show you know that was two hours on the history of how the Grinch stole Christmas and and it was like wow, this is 54 years later and it's still an amazing classic and how it came to be and, and all of that. And, you know, you talk about music and, and uh, historians are now identifying that there are really three indigenous art forms in the United States. One is jazz, uh, one is the Broadway show and one is animation. And so, you know, everything else sort of filtered in, but those are the three art forms that really were, were had their beginnings here and Chuck was one of those guys who was fortunate enough to be a part of that, you know, in the late 20s and the early 30s. And then, you know, for 70 years after that. So, yeah. All right, let's go back to France. Let's and go to France. And if we're talking to Krista, I want you to notice the wall behind her. Oh, my goodness. It's got to be like a foot thick, right? So It's, <laughs> it's 600 years old, this wall. Yeah. And I think that was the last time it was painted, too. <laughs> <laughs> Krista, tell us, share with the audience about how you incorporate the storytelling in your, in your work. And I think Laura's going to put up some of your, your booth page so we can kind of follow that here. Oh, that's nice. Um, you know, I think art and story have gone hand in hand since the beginning of time. If you look at cave paintings, they're telling a story. If you look at... The paintings from the Middle Ages, the, the great religious paintings, they're telling a story. And I believe that all art tells a story. It really does. I, I just think sometimes the, the artist, or, well, we all have to listen to hear the story, but the artist has to listen sometimes too. For me, I've always been a writer and I've always been a photographer. And putting when I found myself as an artist again, that was when I learned that I could put them together. And... Uh, this work uh, is called, this series is called um, And She Lived Happily Ever After. And it takes the viewer on a story. So it's meant to be read or seen in order, but also each individual piece tells a story as well. And it's my hope that the viewer can go through because it's a story about love. It's a story about a broken heart. It's a story about transformation. You know, we all have broken hearts, uh, sometimes from a love affair, sometimes from a broken dream. But uh, we've, all, you know, it's part of the human condition. And so I hope the viewers can can see themselves in my story, too. Yeah, they're well done. And uh, we were talking about you today with Laura and, and Linda and Hannah and Kelly and I and yeah, they love the story. And so I encourage everybody watching to go check out your pages. And uh, they can read each of the, the clips that you've put in there. It's wonderful. Thanks. And um, if there's any artist watching, Chris is a wonderful teacher and guide, kind of a guidance counselor. And uh, she speaks at our events and, and she's been a friend of ours for a long time. So thank you. Thank you. Thank so you. Karen, Karen, let's talk about your uh, new series, Pop of the Wild. Yeah. One off the pop art movement <laughs> and uh, your love of animals. So uh, why don't you tell us why about the new series a little bit? Well, it started at, as, actually as a mistake. I was doing the Bell Hills Art Show a couple of months ago and I think three of the images got distorted. And right at that time, Hannah Redwood's uh, 
social media expert, your daughter sitting there probably drinking, <laughs> uh, was posting and believed that those images were the originals. And then you, Eric, gave me the idea saying, hey, why not try something different? And for me first thinking, wow, doing pr like prints, like digital stuff, sitting in front of the computer and creating all those like colors and stuff, I was thinking, wow, that might be strange and weird, but it turned out pretty good, I think. Turned out really good. In fact, uh, the first time I saw the Instagram mistake, I thought, well, that's really cool. It kind of looks like Andy Warhol's Endangered Species series. Yeah. I, I sold a lot of those in the 80s and 90s. And, uh, and the endangered species have changed, you know, since um, the Warhol days uh, to today. And there's new endangered species and you've picked up on those. And I also see like the chimps right there. They have emotion in their eyes, right? Yeah, and that's what I love to capture in my uh, paintings, their eyes. These aren't photographs. You've actually painted these and then used the Yeah, yeah. so these are from my authentic signature pieces. I do animal couples and I love, not the peacock there, but I love to focus on endangered animals. Um, and that's what I did. I took my old originals and uh, played around with the colors. Right. And make them pop. They're really well done. Thank you. And so those are digital prints on. Yep. And then what's in what's backing them? Aluminum, or. Yes. Yeah. Um, these are actually just some prints, but you, yeah. Yeah. Paper. And they're nice and big. You know, for six hundred ninety-five. Yeah, six hundred ninety-five dollars. A lot of art. They look great. Thank you. Um, Craig, I want to look at a few of your pieces and have you talk about Chuck a little bit more. Bus Q London is a piece that I really liked on your page. I think Laura's pulling that up. Sure, sure. Yeah. Hey, there's our new gallery. Um, the because London, yeah. You well, can totally see that it's Chuck Jones. I mean, <laughs> Yeah, I think that's what, well, that's probably the most popular uh, fine art work that, that we've offered over the years. And uh, as I said, you know, he, he started at Chouinard and uh, throughout his life uh, continued to study and paint. And uh, my, my father and mother uh, were in uh, Berlin during the war. My dad was in counterintelligence in Berlin uh, with the army. And my mom went over there to work with the army as well. And so uh, every now and then they would they would uh, travel and Chuck and my grandmother would, would go visit and they would travel together. And so Chuck, uh, they, they would go to Denmark, they would go to Norway, they would go to Amsterdam, they would go to London here, they would go to Germany. There's one down below that's called Nescafe that uh, is also there. But, um, you know, they were studies that were done and uh, that's the Dutch seaport there. So um, as he traveled, he would paint and, uh, and so these oftentimes they were sketches done before and then paintings done later. But um, the Bus Q London shows so much about the caricature abilities. He actually started uh, before he got into animation doing caricatures on Alvera Street, which is a sort of a, a tourist trap here in downtown L.A. Um, and he said, I don't know why people paid me a dollar to do caricatures back in the 20s but uh, he was doing them. And you can see that in the Bus Q London, uh, sort of that, that exaggerated posing in the faces of the people on the street. He you know, captured those, he would take notes. When I, when I was growing up, he always had a satchel with, with many, many uh, um, sketch pads and pencils and pens and whatnot. And he took notes on life in those sketchbooks. And so, you know, that being a watercolor that was then, these are many prints. There are some originals in here, but, you know, I, as I look through here, it's such a diverse thing. He was always studying and growing and, and trying to figure out how to do things better. And I think that was, if anything, it was what personified Chuck in that he, he was never satisfied. He won four Academy Awards. He was given the Arts de Chevalier Award from uh, the, the, arts in France, he was, you know, the directors, all these different things, but he said, thank you very much. I appreciate that. But 
let me, I'm going to put that back on the shelf and say, what's next? And so each of these works of art has to do with how to advance him as an artist, him as a human being, how to express himself, how to communicate with others. And so, and I think that's what I heard from these other artists and certainly listening to the other symposiums. It's about the expression. And Krista was talking about the story and, you know, each, you know, we run the, the Chuck Jones Center for Creativity, as you had mentioned. And, you know, I was one of the founders in 1999 when Chuck was still alive. And really it was based on the premise that Chuck identified. And he said that, that every single person has a creative genius inside of them. And it comes out in, in many different ways. Some of them is art, some of them business, some of them teaching, some of them in, in medicine, some of them in all these different ways, but everybody has a creative, unique creative genius inside of them. And the sooner that we identify who that is today and express that and learn how to get better at that, the better off the world and we ourselves are going to be. And so I think that's why I'm so, one, inspired, Eric, by you and your team deciding in the middle of this bizarre time to do something different, to do something new, to, to, to continue to communicate the beauty of what we do in the art business. Because, you know, I remember in 2008, the week after the stock market crashed in the, you know, the beginning of the Great Recession, and you and I, you know, sat there, you'd asked me to do the keynote speech that year at, at Art Expo, and, and we both sat in the corner going, this doesn't feel good. But I remember you got up to introduce me and you said, you know what? People have been selling and buying artwork for thousands of years. And today is not going to be any different. We're going to go through struggles. We're going to go through hard times, but we are going to get through this together. And what you guys have decided to do with this rave and continue to do this during this time, I just applaud you because you guys are amazing. And I'm, I'm excited to be a part of it. And, uh, and I look at these ladies and, you know, brilliant artists, and, uh, and think, you know what, you continue to do it. So thank you and your whole team for, for having this platform to continue to inspire thousands of people. Well, thank you. That was unexpected, but I appreciate it. Yeah. It actually, to let everybody know, we kind of like started putting this together. And then over the last couple of weeks, man, it got really intense. I mean, it was like putting on a regular live event. You know, Kelly wasn't coming to bed until like one o'clock in the morning. She's putting in images and everything. And oh my God. So, you know, my hat's off to Kelly and Linda and Laura and Hannah and, you know, everybody who worked on this. So, yeah. And think what's going to happen next time, Eric. You, one is going to be better and, 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 and Kelly, it's going to be even bigger. So yeah. you're never going to go to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> so Krista, Back to you. What are your final thoughts? What do you think about the future of the art business? Oh, the future of the art business. You know, it's, I wish I had a magic ball to tell you, but I will tell you this. Um, the art business, like the world has been through a lot of ups and downs. And a lot of people have said, you know, oh, you know, it's all over, it's all over, party's over. That's not true. That's never been true before. I've seen recessions before. I've seen wars. I've seen lots of things happen. And art always survives. Art always has survived. So for any artist out there, keep making. I think art is more important now than it's ever been. And your work is important. Um, and I... I I also am really pleased to see that this event is going on because it, it brings us together. These conversations are important to have. We've all been isolated and, and hopefully we're, we're all still making, but to come together like this and to share what we're doing, um, it's really powerful and yeah. it's gonna help move us forward, hopefully to something even better. So Anthony Del Ju was on last night and another big publishing company out of Atlanta. And, you know, he, he had signed on at six o'clock East Coast time yesterday. And he said, I was just going to check it out for five minutes because he didn't come on till like 7.30, right? And uh, he said, I haven't left. I've been glued to this. And now I remember why I got into the art business, which was, was awesome to hear Anthony say that he loved the Dave Navarro gig. And, you know, I kind of thought, 
uh oh, I think I heard about 20 F bombs last night on the <laughs> thing. It all worked out really good. I mean, I was getting texts left and right from people who were like, this is awesome. So yeah, that was fun. And thank you guys for joining us and you know, sharing your gift with uh, a lot of the collectors that are watching tonight. You know, I think you heard me at the beginning, we had over 1,100 people last night. So that was shocking to me. That was really great. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Chris. Thank, thank you, Craig. And uh, you can check out uh, all of their booths on the Rave site. And I'm going to re remind everybody that if you do purchase a piece of art through the month of December, you get free freight and you get a free art print if you're one of the first 50 people by uh, the print by uh, Gatsby and Dual Diagnosis. So 